property. This place is an international wholesale street where many business people from all over the country come to stack up, including some international merchants. This wholesale street is very unique because it features a wide range of goods of all categories, all of which are sold by the caddy that is around half kilo. Hence, everyone calls it Caddy Village. For example, these small hair ties are only 10 yuan per caddy, with about 70 to 80 hair ties per caddy, making the cost of each hair tie around 0.1 yuan. As for small toys, they are roughly 8 yuan per caddy, with about two toys per caddy, meaning each small toy costs 4 yuan. Children's hair clips are also 10 yuan per caddy, as are these various household goods, including electronics, beauty products, jewelry, etc., all sold by weight. For instance, these large hair clips are 10 yuan per caddy, while purchasing one outside normally costs around 10 yuan. Most of the goods in 1 yuan and 2 yuan stores are of this type. The majority of goods here are of inferior quality, yet consumers cannot resist the allure of low prices, leading to brisk sales. International merchants purchase these substandard items and dump them overseas, severely disrupting the normal competitive order foreign markets. Guys, selling toys by caddy shouldn't be anything new, right? Some of the big brand toys are sold this way. Have you seen it? Regarding toys of this quality, how much do you think they are worth? This toy in my hand is a Disney brand with a retail price in physical stores marked as 63 yuan. But the online price is 45 yuan. If I tell you now that high quality toys like this are sold for 8.5 yuan per caddy, you must think it has to be a scam. But guys, this is real. I have a friend in Guangzhou who is in the foreign trade toy business. For some reason, these goods were backlogged in the warehouse and couldn't be sold. Later, he contacted us, saying he had 18 tons of similar toys he wanted to sell off. 18 tons, selling at such a low price. Do you think he can still make a profit? Against the backdrop of China's domestic economic slowdown and decreased demand, not only inferior small commodities and toys, but also China's new three products have been flooding the foreign market, drawing international attention. These include electric vehicles, lithium-ion batteries, and solar cells. China experts warn that China's overcapacity is forcing foreign governments to adopt stronger retaliatory measures. The ensuing confrontation is something both China's economy and the global trade system cannot afford. One emblematic example of the impact of China's overcapacity is in the solar panel sector. Driven by the Chinese Communist Party's or CCP's subsidy policies, China's solar panel production capacity is grossly excessive leading to a dramatic plunge in global prices. An analyst at Wood McKenzie, Hua Yan Sun, states that the oversupply has led to a 42% reduction in the price of Chinese solar panels in 2023, making them over 60% cheaper than those manufactured in the USA. Some Chinese manufacturers that only produce components are forced to operate at a loss to maintain market share. According to data from the China Photovoltaic Industry Association, by the end of 2023, China's annual production capacity for solar panel components reached 861 gigawatts, more than twice the global installation volume of 390 gigawatts. Forecasts by Wood McKenzie and Rystad Energy, an energy research company, suggest that with the development of major Chinese companies like Xi'an Longi Silicon Materials, this year's capacity could increase by an additional 500 to 600 gigawatts. In other words, China's production of solar panels has not decreased in response to falling demand. Instead, it continues to rise. Regarding the excessive production of solar panels, Dong Shu Yang, a Chinese energy policy analyst at the independent think tank Climate Energy Finance, said, quote, It is expected that the production capacity of silicon wafers, cells and components that China will bring online in 2024, is already enough to meet the global total demand from now until 2032. If China continues to produce solar panels in large quantities, the global market will be unable to absorb this massive output. This will directly impact the market price of solar panels and subsequently disrupt healthy market competition. The effects of overproduction are already beginning to show. According to data released by the think tank Amber, in 2023, nearly half of China's solar panels were exported to Europe. 
This has led to the announcement of closure plans by several European factories. Over a decade ago, the United States imposed tariffs on Chinese solar panel products to counteract low price dumping. Recently, the U.S. has continued to impose additional tariffs on solar panels produced by Chinese manufacturers in Southeast Asia to counter the impact of overproduction on the U.S. market. The steel industry has not been spared from the impacts of overcapacity and economic downturn. Recently, China listed steel companies have been releasing their annual reports for 2023. Among those that have published the reports, Angang Steel Company reported a net loss of 3.3 billion yuan for 2023, compared to a profit of 156 million yuan in the same period last year. This marks the highest loss among the companies that have disclosed their reports. Another steel company that turned from profit to loss is Shandong Steel, which reported a loss of 400 million yuan. Other companies reporting losses include Chongqing Iron and Steel, which saw its losses increase by 46.6 percent to 1.5 billion yuan. Similarly, Ma'an Shan Steel reported a loss of 1.3 billion yuan, experiencing a 54.8 percent increase in its losses. Some steel companies have not released their annual reports, but expect to report losses for 2023 in their performance reports. These include Lingyuan Iron and Steel, forecasting a loss of 677 million yuan; Sun Steel Mingguan, forecasting a loss of 664 million yuan; Bengang Steel Plates, forecasting a loss of 1.8 billion yuan. Liuzhou Iron and Steel forecasting a loss of approximately 864 million to 1.1 billion yuan, and Anyang Iron and Steel predicting a loss of 1.55 billion yuan. Regarding the decline in profitability and profits of listed steel companies, Caixin Media published an article on April 1st. In the article, they stated that the main reasons are the contraction in social steel demand, overcapacity in the steel industry. And the persistently high cost of raw materials. Statistics from the China Iron and Steel Association show that in 2023, the key steel companies' purchase costs of imported iron ore increased by 5.3 percent compared to the previous year. Besides, the average value of the China Steel Price Index decreased by 9 percent compared to the previous year. The total profits of the association's member steel companies. Also dropped by 12.5 percent year over year, with the average sales profit margin narrowing to just 1.3 percent, a reduction of 0.17 percentage points from the year before. This data confirms the issue of overcapacity within the steel industry. Steel prices, often seen as a gauge for the industry's health, are significantly influenced by the ups and downs of housing prices in China. The market is currently facing a glut of six billion new homes that no one is buying, alongside a surplus of second-hand homes that also fail to attract buyers. This bursting of the housing bubble, combined with the diminished interest in purchasing homes, has resulted in developers becoming hesitant to buy steel for construction projects. Financial Times analysts believe that after the pandemic, the recovery of China's domestic consumer market has been lower than expected, and industries such as steel, automotive, and solar panels are all experiencing overcapacity. To salvage the domestic economy, the Chinese government has resorted to low price dumping and political maneuvering with these surplus steel materials. This is why, in the first two months of this year, China's steel exports reached an eight-year high for the same period, as the CCP authorities are using low-price dumping of steel to digest the excess capacity. Thomas Gutierrez, the Asian editor at consultancy firm Colonish Commodities, indicated that following the CCP's two sessions, Chinese steel companies began significantly reducing prices in their export contracts. Our initial expectation was that if the real estate market stabilized, exports might slow down this year. However, with the real estate market continuing to decline, it now appears certain that China will increase its exports. He said. Harry Murphy Cruz, assistant director and economist at Moody's Analytics, shares a similar view, analyzing that the bleak outlook for the Chinese market has also impacted the price of iron ore. He said, "Quote: The lack of meaningful stimulus coming out of last week's two sessions has dented the construction pipeline for this year. 
pushing iron ore prices down to just a smidgen above $100 a ton, its lowest since August 2023. The CCP's dumping practices have been condemned by both Europe and the United States. The EU, drawing on a March 27 report from the European NGO Transport and Environment, believes Chinese-made electric vehicles will comprise over 25 percent of Europe's electric vehicle market in 2024. This market share could also rise by an additional five percentage points from the previous year. The strong expansion of Chinese electric vehicles will eventually break the interests of traditional European car manufacturers protected by tariffs for a long time. Therefore, it's about time the European automotive industry needs to prepare for this. Meanwhile, the U.S. has published the 2024 National Trade Estimate Report. This report highlights that in sectors like advanced manufacturing and critical high-tech industries, the CCP has formulated and pursued production and market shares that can only be achieved through non-market means. It continues to rely on these non-market strategies and industrial planning to maintain a dominant position in global key industries. The report says the Chinese government provides substantial government guidance, resources, and regulatory support for Chinese companies. At the same time, they restrict the entry of imported goods, foreign-made goods, and foreign service providers into the Chinese market. The report also mentions the Made in China 2025 plan, noting that its ultimate goal at the expense of foreign enterprises is to gain a larger global market share in 10 strategic areas. Finally, the report evaluates that the CCP's practices could cause or further exacerbate distortions in the international market, create severe overcapacity in many target industries, and could cause long-term harm to the interests of the United States and its allies and partners. In addition to dumping steel into the international market, the CCP also transports steel to overseas infrastructure in developing countries, such as the Belt and Road Initiative funded by China itself. This move is seen by Colin Hamilton, a commodities analyst at BMO Montreal, as a politically motivated act. He said, quote, before it's purely economic to try to export steel to the rest of the world. This time around has been more geopolitical and strategic. Some analysts argue that compared to 2016, due to tariffs and other trade barriers imposed by Western countries on Chinese imports, as well as subsidies for green steel, local producers are better protected from Chinese dumping. However, this is not a long-term solution, as it's evident from the CCP's increasingly clandestine actions that its ambitions are continuously expanding. If not thoroughly curbed, all international markets will eventually be penetrated by the CCP. In response to China's overcapacity, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen stated on March 27 that she plans to press Beijing during her visit to China in April, focusing on China's overcapacity and issues distorting the global economy. Yellen expressed concern over the current state of China's overcapacity, stating, In the past, in industries like steel and aluminum, Chinese government support led to substantial overinvestment and access capacity that Chinese firms look to export abroad at depressed prices. This maintained production and employment in China, but forced industry in the rest of the world to contract. China's overcapacity distorts global prices and production patterns and hurts American firms and workers, as well as firms and workers around the world. Yellen added, We have raised overcapacity in previous discussions with China, and I plan to make it a key issue in discussions during my next trip there. In February, Jay Shamba, Undersecretary for International Affairs at the U.S. Treasury, voiced the Biden administration's deep concerns. He warned that Beijing's attempts to boost China's struggling economy might result in a flood of low-priced exports. This could destabilize the global market and potentially spark an economic disaster. Janet Yellen is currently in China for discussions, facing a challenging negotiation ahead. Her main goal is to convince China to reduce its production capacity and implement significant systemic reforms within the country. However, she faces a group of core Chinese leaders who have recently assured American entrepreneurs that they will never change their systems. Beyond minor industrial tweaks, these leaders show little willingness to overhaul the distribution, labor, and welfare systems. 
They view such social reforms crucial to labor and consumption matters affecting the populace as off limits. During Yellen's visit to China, the concept of new quality productivity proposed by Xi Jinping in response to economic difficulties was also discussed. He aims to boost the economy while avoiding the traditional route of stimulating the economy through mass consumption. The concept of new quality productivity calls for significant investment in electric vehicles, batteries, biomanufacturing, and drones to boost the low altitude economy. Yet, at its core, this economic strategy is fundamentally flawed. A report by The Economist mentioned that Xi Jinping's new quality productivity plan has three fatal flaws. These flaws are likely to lead to widespread dissatisfaction within China and could provoke frustration globally. The first flaw is its neglect of consumers. Data shows that China's consumer spending only accounts for 37 percent of its GDP, significantly lower than the global average. To restore consumer confidence amidst a real estate slump, stimulus policies must be adopted. To encourage consumers to save less and spend more. At the same time, social security and health care insurance must be improved, and reforms to open public services to all cities and migrants must be launched. However, the CCP is unwilling to do so because it would harm the interests within the party. Under the CCP's new quality productivity policy, some industrial capacities could increase by more than 75 percent before 2030. However, this leads to another flaw in the policy. Weak domestic demand means that intermediate products must be exported to other countries. But the United States, wary of being disrupted by low price dumping, will definitely block imports of Chinese products. Europe is also concerned that its automobile manufacturers will be hit by the CCP's dumping of cheap cars. Although some CCP officials suggest exporting to the global south, if these emerging countries' industrial development is impacted by the same China shock, they will begin to be wary of Chinese products. With China currently accounting for 31 percent of global manufacturing, how much more can it export to the world in an era of protectionism? Indeed, the cheap products exported by China have led to a global pushback. This is not limited to the United States and Europe, which have already put countermeasures in place. Countries like Brazil, India, Mexico, Indonesia, Argentina, the UK, and Chile have launched anti-dumping investigations into various Chinese imports. As the situation evolves, it is expected that more countries will take similar actions. The third flaw of the new quality productivity plan is Xi Jinping's unrealistic view of entrepreneurs. In present-day China, politically favored industries are booming with investments, while the essential elements of capitalist entrepreneurship are being neglected. Entrepreneurs are vocal about their concerns over Xi Jinping's erratic policies, fearing political retribution or even imprisonment. This has led to stock market valuations reaching their lowest in 25 years. Cautious foreign investments, capital flight, and an increase in the emigration of the wealthy. All of which negatively affect the Chinese economy. Therefore, if the CCP does not ease its grip on entrepreneurs, innovation will suffer and resources will be squandered. Given the many flaws in the new quality productivity plan, why hasn't the CCP changed its course? The primary issue stems from Xi's refusal to consider feedback. With Xi Jinping's centralization of power, economic experts have been marginalized. And leaders receive nothing but flattery. In such an environment, what's more distressing than the economy is national security.